It's really great to see you all this morning. I'd like to thank the music uh, ministry team uh, for their efforts to prepare our hearts for this morning. And we sang a lot about love this morning, didn't we? Yeah, we truly did. So I kind of wonder what this morning's message is going to be, huh? I kind of wonder. I don't know. Uh, but before I get into the message, I'd like to just speak about a time of, in my life uh, that I was in great need. This was probably about 12 years ago, maybe 13 years ago in my life. Uh, and basically what had happened was I was coming out of a divorce. Uh, my, my wife at the time had divorced me. And I was, I was living in a three-story townhome uh, that I couldn't afford any longer. Uh, I didn't have anything. I had my clothes. I had my television. And I had my punching bag. And that's all I had. That's all I had. I didn't have any furniture, didn't have any silverware, didn't have a couch, didn't have a bed to sleep on. I had nothing. I just had my clothes, my television, and my punching bag. That's all I had. And believe me, at that point in time in my life, uh, that punching bag had a lot of use. A lot of use. So one day at work, I met a friend. And we just started talking, and my situation of life was just brought up. And I, and I just mentioned, you know, that I, I didn't have much going on for me at that particular time. I, I didn't even have a bed to sleep on. And, and she just listened to me. She listened to me as I told her the story. And it, and it really wasn't a big deal for me. It just, it was my life at that time. I, I, I didn't say anything to, to invoke any action. I just, this was just my life. And I was just speaking to her. But she could see that I was in need. She saw it. Even though I couldn't see it myself, she saw that I was in need, and she wanted to help me, and she did. So one day, a couple days later, I saw my friend again at work, and she goes, hey, I have something for you. And I said, wow, okay, well, what is it? And what she did was she gave me a queen-size inflatable ear mattress, and I took it, and I brought it home, and that night I inflated it, and I slept on an inflatable queen-size air mattress. I wasn't on the floor anymore. I was king of the castle, right? I'm no longer on that, that cold floor. I had something to sleep on. I was blessed by her actions, and, 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 and I was just so thrilled by, it, by her act of love for me because she saw that there was a need that I needed in my life, and she could fulfill it, and she did. And the thing that astounded me the most was that she didn't ask for anything in return. She didn't sit there and say, hey, I have this, you need this, I got this for about 140 bucks, but I'll give it to you for 40. That's a great deal, Jake, take it. There was none of that. There was no time limit to how long I could use this mattress. It wasn't like, hey, I got this, you can have it, but I'm gonna need it next month because I'm going somewhere and I'm gonna need this back. There was none of that. There was no, hey, I'm gonna give this to you, but I need it back because it's mine right? It's mine, and I want this back. No. It was given to me because she saw a need that she could fulfill, and she blessed me by her actions, and she asked for nothing in return, absolutely nothing. I was just totally blessed by her actions. Well, I would say probably about six, six and a half years later, I married that friend, and she continues to bless me today by her actions. Now that's just a story about my life in a time in need. How about you? Was there ever a moment in your life where you had a great need that you couldn't quite fulfill yourself, but yet someone else came into your life and blessed you and asked for absolutely nothing in return? Has that ever happened to you? And if so, after this message, I would love to hear it. I would be really encouraged to hear it. So when we're done and we're out getting snacks and you want to come up and you want to share your story, I would take the time and listen to you because it's just such an important thing that happens in our life. So now I bring this story up about blessing others and loving others because love is going to be the topic that we're going to be talking about today. Love is going to be the main source that we're going to focus on today. The message of this title is Love Fulfills. And we're going to be diving into the book of Romans. We're going to be looking at chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. And we're going to look at this principle of loving others, and we're going to see how loving others fulfills the law. So I invite you, if you haven't already, 
So open up your Bibles or your electric readers, your tablets, your phones, whatever you've got, to the book of Romans. Those of you that are watching online, please follow us. Come be encouraged by this message. Those of you that are in the lobby, I just invite you to come follow along with us as well. But more importantly, I invite you to open up your hearts. I really want your hearts to be open here because love is going to come from our hearts. And it's extremely important this morning that we understand this, this Christian principle of loving others because it's going to treat us, it's going to change the way we see others and the way we treat others. Loving fulfills the law, and it's what God wants from us. So if you haven't already, I would invite you to open up again to the book of Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. I'll read the verse, and then we will pray. Romans 13, verse 8, starts with, Owe no man anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. And for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandments are summed up in this word, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Let's bow our heads and just pray really quick here. Heavenly Father, gracious King, Father, we come to you, humble children, assembled to praise and worship you. And Father, we love you, for we know that we love because you loved us first. So Father, may our hearts be encouraged this morning by this message of love. May we inspect our hearts to see where we can open up our, our hearts to loving others more. And Father, I pray that you would work through me, that you would help me to be clear, you would help me to be calm, and you would help me to be precise. Father, these are not my words. These are not my words that I am speaking here. These are your words. These are God-given words to help us to move in a direction that brings you glory. So, Father, I just pray that you would be with us this morning. I pray that you would be with Steve as he's across on the other side of the world. He's loving others right now, encouraging others right now helping others right now, Father. So I pray that you would be with him and Bob Clinton. I pray that you would be with the children's, uh, the children's home, that souls would be encouraged and that they would feel love, Father. So I thank you for this opportunity. And I again, Father, we give you all the glory. And it's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Okay, so as we go into our first point, our first point today is going to be love. Love. It's a point number one. And as we look at verse 8, we see that Paul's going to sit there and say, Oh, no man, anything. Oh, no man, anything. And we got to ask ourselves, well, Paul, what do you mean by this? Oh, no man, anything. What are, you, what are you trying to say, Paul? And to get a better understanding of what Paul is trying to say, we have to go backwards a little bit to verses 6 and 7 of chapter 13 so that we can get a, a good perspective on what's happening. And basically what Paul is saying is, hey, we need to pay our taxes to, to the proper authority, okay? We need to pay up what we owe. We have to pay our honor to where honor is owed. We have to pay respect to where respect is owed. And we just, we need to pay back what we owe. And that's what Paul is saying here. When it comes to taxes, we shouldn't be in debt to anyone. When it comes to be having money, we shouldn't be in debt to anyone. We should pay what we owe. And so Paul says that in verses 6 and 7, and we come into verse 8, and he says, Oh, no man, anything. Okay. All right, we're going to do our best. We're going to pay up what we owe. That's good. But then we come to that next word. That next word, except. Except. That changes things a little bit, and it should make us be like, mm, except what, Paul? Oh, no man, anything except what? And as we finish the reading through the scripture here, it says, except to love each other. To love each other. So basically, we are to owe no man anything. We are not to be in debt to anyone except for love. Love. We are to pay up with love. And love is going to be the one thing that we always are going to continue to owe others. See, we can pay off our taxes. We can pay off our house mortgage. We can pay off our car loan. We can even pay back a friend. If we borrowed money, and we pay back the loan that we gave our friend. We could pay that off. 
But when it comes to loving others, we will never, ever, ever pay that off. We should always be and continuously be in debt to loving others. We can never sit there and say, you know what? Well, I've done all the loving that I can do for today, so I'm done. I'm done loving. We can never sit there and say, well, I've reached my quota of love for the week, so if you guys want love for me, come see me Monday because I'm all out of love. It's not how it works. Love is going to be a permanent obligation for us Christians. As soon as we pay up with love, guess what? We're to love more. And as soon as we dish out more of our love, we're in debt to more love. We are always going to be in debt to love. And this is what Paul is teaching us here. This is what God wants us to know in our hearts, that we are always to be in debt to loving others. Now, this is a, this is a, a, a Christian philosophy here. This is, this is the heart of Christian living right here. It's this love that we have that's going to separate ourselves from others. And others are going to understand that we are Christians, that we're disciples of Jesus Christ by the way and by the manner of how we love. John 13, 34 through 35 says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. And just as I have loved you, you are to love another. And by this, everyone, everyone, not a few people, not some people, Everyone will know that you are my disciples. If what? If you have love for another. Love is extremely important, brothers and sisters. It's what we owe. We owe this to everyone every single day, to family, to friends, to co-workers, to strangers. And we talked about this already, to enemies enemies even our enemies we are commanded to love the ones that hurt us the ones that are against us these people especially we're commanded to love as difficult as that may be we are to love our enemies paul says in romans 12 14 bless those who persecute you bless and do not curse them now blessing those that hurt us Blessing those that are against us, man, that's not easy. That is not an easy thing to do. When someone takes actions against us or someone retaliates against us, it's in our nature that we want to retaliate against them. We want to stand up for ourselves. We, we don't want to take that. But that's not how we should act. Sometimes we may want to gloat when our enemies fall. Sometimes our heart may want to rejoice when they fall. But even that sort of thinking is, a, is not what our Father wants because that's not love. We have to love our enemies. Romans 12, 19 through 20 says that if our enemy is hungry, we should feed them. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. We are not to repay evil with evil. We are to overcome evil with good. We are to overcome with love. And this is an extremely difficult thing to do. This is extremely difficult because it's hard to dismiss the hurt that people cause to us. It's hard to accept the evil and the wrongs that someone do against us. But I will say this. I'll give you this one piece of advice because this helps me and this encourages me. When our hearts want to gloat and when we want to retaliate against those who are, are against us, against those who are hurt us, think of Christ. Think of him. Because if Christ did not love his enemies, I don't know if there'd be Christians today. I really just don't know. Christ loved us when we were against him. Christ loved us when we were rebellious against him, when we were children of wrath, he still loved us. I mean, we love because he loved us first. Think of him. If Christ can love a wretched sinner like us, then we, as his children, can love our enemies. As beloved children, 
as imitators of God, we should follow this command of loving even our enemies. Now, Christ has pulled us out of the darkness. He's removed us from that lost state and that darkened state, and he's then taken us out, and he's put us in the light. Now we must continue to walk in that light. We must walk in love as Christ has loved us. We must always be in debt to loving others, brothers and sisters. This is how we should act. We should constantly be paying out with patience and with kindness and with tenderheartedness and with encouragement. This is our charge. We must surrender our need to be rude and arrogant to others. We must continue to love with a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Because that's how Christ loved us. Now, Paul finishes off this statement with, the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. And now we're talking about Old Testament law here. And the rules and statutes that God gave his people. And from Genesis to Deuteronomy, I don't know if you know this, but just from Genesis to Deuteronomy, there's, there's over 600 laws. 600 of them. Actually, there's about 613 laws. I mean, there's no way that anyone could have kept those laws. If you broke one of those 613 laws, you broke all of them. It was impossible to keep that law. But now Paul is sitting there saying to us, hey, if you love another, you fulfill the law. All of those laws, all 613, are fulfilled by one action, love. I mean, do you see how amazing of a statement that is? It's amazing. Don't ever, ever, ever doubt love and the power of love and what that can do. The commandments are fulfilled with love. Now, we can have all things... We could have it all. But if we don't have love, we don't have anything. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3 says that if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and I have all knowledge and I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I have not love, I have nothing. And if I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but yet not have love, I gain nothing. Nothing. I mean, what good is it to have all knowledge without love? What good is it to have all faith, but not have love? It doesn't help others. It doesn't. What good is it to sit there and to say to someone every single day, hey, I love you. I love you, I love you, I love you, but you don't do anything to show it. What good is that? How does that help them? And more importantly, what good is it to sit there and say, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I don't show love? It doesn't help anyone. See, there needs to be action behind love. There just needs to. Actions speak louder than words. And if our actions are not showing that our heart marker is guided towards love, then we are failing our Christian duties. 1 John 3.18 says, Let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. See, talk is cheap. It's cheap. We need to love in deed and in truth. We need to love with action. So as we're sitting here right now, taking this in, learning about love, we got to be asking ourselves, okay, well, what kind of love are we talking about here? What, what, what kind of love fulfills the law? Well, I can just simply say this. It can't be an empty law or an empty love. It can't be a shallow love. That love is not going to fulfill the law. Then that's not what we're talking about here. It can't just be words and talk, just, just hot air coming out of our mouth. Yeah, I love you, I love you, I love you. But there's no action behind it. That love is not going to fulfill the law. God wants us to be stirred into action because we love. That sort of love is going to fulfill the law. We need a love that's looking to satisfy the needs of others. We need a love that's going to minister to others. A love that looks to satisfy the needs of others. A love that teaches. A love that provides. A love that forgives. A love that sacrifices. A love that bears all things and endures all things. 
a love that moves and acts. This is the type of love that we're speaking about here. It's not that sentimental, uh, tingly feeling in our belly that's going to fulfill the law. We're speaking about looking to satisfy the needs of others. Let no one seek his own good, but the good for his neighbor. We're talking about agape-style love here. Agape love. Agape love is a love that, that looks to satisfy the needs of others, yet asks for nothing in return. They don't want anything in return. They're not looking to try to gain more notoriety. They're not trying to gain favor, and they're not even trying to gain money, and they're not even trying to gain more love. It's just simply done because there's a need, and we can fulfill that, that, that need because we love. This is the sort of love that is going to fulfill the law because this is the sort of love that Christ loved us with. Christ moved, and he acted because he loved us. Let us be imitators of that love. Now, as we talk about how love fulfills the law, we're going to move to our second point, which is the law. It's the law. Now, Paul has much to say about the law in the book of Romans. He's got much to say. Examples, chapter 2, Paul says that it's not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but it's the doers who will be justified. Chapter 3, Paul says that through the law comes knowledge of sin and that no human will be justified through the works of the law. In chapter 4, the promises of Abraham did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. In chapter 7, we're released from the law through Christ, and here we are in chapter 13 with love fulfills the law. Paul has much to say about the law. And as we move into verse 9, Paul brings us face to face with the law. He brings us face to face with the Ten Commandments. Verse 9 reads, For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandments are summed up in this word, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So when Paul says, for the commandments, he's speaking about the Ten Commandments, or as the Hebrews like to call it, the Decalogue, right? The Ten Commandments. It, it comes straight out of Exodus chapter 20, and it, it was given to Moses in Mount Sinai. Now, these were God-given laws and God-given commandments meant for his people to be instructions on how to live. The commandments deal with relationships. Relationships. The first four of the Ten Commandments deal with one's relationships towards God, right? Commandment number one, you shall have no God before me. Commandment number two, you shall have not a graven image. Commandment number three, you shall not use my name in vain. Commandment number four, you shall remember the Sabbath. All those having to deal with one's relationship towards God. The second half of the Ten Commandments have to deal with one's relationship towards another. Number five, you shall honor your, your mother and father. Six, you shall not murder. Seven, you shall not commit adultery. Eight, you shall not steal. Nine, you shall not lie. And ten, you shall not covet. All of them dealing with relationships. And these were God-given laws given to his people because of the covenant that they were now in with him. Now, a covenant just establishes the basis of a relationship and the expectation of two parties. And in this instance, the parties being God and the children of Israel. And by following these laws, the Israelites would remain in their covenantial relationship with God and live in distinction from the outside pagan nations. And we need to understand that kings, nobles, prophets, they didn't come up with these laws. They didn't come up with these commandments. God did. God came up with them. It was an expression of love that God gave these laws to the Israelites. It was a way for God to say, hey, I love you, and by my grace, I have chosen you as my people. I have plucked you out. You are now mine, and now you are going to live in honor of me. You are going to have these laws, and you're going to follow these laws to best glorify me. And Israel's identity as God's people is going to be based upon them staying obedient to God's law. It was by grace that God gave his law to the Israel nation. 
And Paul finishes off this statement here by saying, and any other commandments are summed up in this word, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So we have these 10 commandments, and Paul is saying, and if there were any other more commandments, it could all be summed up by one thing, love. Love your neighbor as yourself. No matter what other commandment may come, love is going to be a part of it. Love is going to saturate it. So we are to live in harmony with one another, with those in our homes, with those outside our homes. I mean, this is how we bear fruit for God. This is how we bring God glory. We are to bear with one another's burdens. We are to be patient and kind, and we are to live peaceably with all so that we can fulfill the law of Christ. Now, loving is going to reflect uh, or, or affect our relationship with God and others. If we love, it, it's definitely going to have an effect, right? If we love, we're not going to murder. If we love, we're not going to commit adultery. If we truly love, we're not going to covet and we're not going to lie. And if we truly, truly love God, then we're not going to have any other God before us. It's just loving him. Love fills up and completes the law. It fills it to the brim. It doesn't get close to the top. It doesn't somewhat fill it. It completes it. All 613 laws fulfilled by love. Again, I got to say, don't underestimate the power of love. So I got to ask this question. Are we fulfilling the law? Is loving others a priority in our Christian life? See, we may love those that are in our inner circle, but, but what about those on the outside of the circle? What about them? I mean, it's extremely important here that we understand this kingdom principle and it's extremely important that we move with a sense of Christian urgency when we think about loving others. If in your heart you're like, no, I think I could do a little bit more on that, then go. Do it. Move with Christian urgency to love others. Because all the commandments are met when we have love for another. Now, the Bible says eight times that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the most powerful verse that I can find in the Bible uh, comes from Leviticus uh, 19.18. It reads, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. I think it's the way that God puts his stamp at the end of that that gets me. He utters his commands, and then he finishes it off with, I am am the Lord. Oof, that's complete authority right there. I mean, we got to understand that loving others is not a New Testament thing. I know sometimes we can get trapped up in this old law, new law, Old Testament, New Testament, but whether it's old or new, God says that love fulfills it all. From the beginning to the end, it's all about love. It's just not a New Testament principle. God's been telling his people this since Leviticus. And we are to love because God loves. We don't commit adultery. Why? Because God is faithful. He's a faithful God. And if we love God, we want to imitate God. And if God is faithful, then we need to be faithful. And we also need to understand that God's law was an expression of his character. Sometimes we need to look at the Old Testament law and we've got to ask ourselves, God, why did you give this law? What does this law mean? How does this law reflect who you are as our sovereign father? Well, here we go. We don't commit adultery. Why? Because, again, God's character is faithful. So we must love and be faithful, too. We don't bear false witness. Why? Because God's character is truth. And so we're not going to lie because we want to imitate that. We don't covet. Why? Because God's character is a peaceful character, and he's content with himself. And we don't have any other God before ourselves. Why? Because he is sovereign. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the one who is, who is from the beginning to the end. I mean, these laws were just a shadow of the good things to come, namely Jesus Christ. And the laws were a guardian for the people, but until Christ came, and now that he's come, 
the way of faith has come. The law is no longer needed for us. Not the Old Testament law. But we do have to understand that we're still under a law, a new law, and a new covenant. The covenant of Christ and the law of Christ. Romans 7, 4 says that we have died to the law through the body of Christ so that we may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. Romans 7, 6 says that, but now we are released from the law, having died to that which has held us captive so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. See, we're no longer bound to the old law. We have died to it because Christ has died and Christ has been resurrected. And now that that has happened, we are under his law. And he desires in his law that we love, that we have love for one another. He yearns for us to be Christians, not just on the outside, not just in word and talk, but he wants us to be Christians on the inside. See, our circumcision is by the heart and by the spirit, not by the letter of the law. And we must adhere to the Spirit and love others so that we can fulfill the law of Christ. The law said, do this and you shall live. And Christ says, it is finished, now live. We are to live separate and distinct from the other non-believers. We are to continuously to pay out in love. Love is the new law and the new command that we must adhere to. And when we have love for our neighbors, then we ourselves fulfill the law. Amen. Well, we went through point one, which is love. We went to point two, which is law. And now we enter into our third point. And as we enter into our third point, we're going to just kind of understand and we should recognize that, that the third point is just merely an echo of something that we've already spoke about, right? In the first point, we studied about how we're not to owe anyone anything except for our love. And we read and we learned that love fulfills the law. And here we are in verse 10, and we're going to read a very similar message. Verse 10 reads, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. See, we act peaceably and caring to our neighbors, looking to satisfy any need that we can for them because we love our neighbors. And some of us may ask, well, who's our neighbors? Well, easy answer, everyone. Everyone. Everyone that we come across to in our daily life is our neighbor. And we have to make sure that our actions must be driven by love so that we don't harm them and we don't wrong them. And in doing so, we fulfill the law. Because we love, we fulfill. It's just a repeat. So therefore, our last point is simply the same as our first point. So our first point was love. Our second point was law. Say it with me. What's our third point then? Love. Amen. Point one, love. Point two, law. Point three, Love. It's not rocket science. It's just love. And the message is clear. And there's no escaping it. You can't escape this. If we're to love, and if we're going to fulfill the law, and if we're going to truly show people that we are disciples of Christ, then we need to move in that manner. We need to constantly be in debt to loving others. We are constantly to be bearing, kind, and long-suffering, and forgiving others. This is our debt. And we will always have to pay this up. I'm sorry, there may be times where you don't want to pay it up, but we have to. Because we're Christians. Because Christ loved us. So when family and friends come into our life and they betray us and they hurt us, we are to love. When sickness runs rampant in your family and you want to rage, we are to love again and again and again. It's reiterated in the Bible. It's the message that God, our Heavenly Father, wants us to understand, and he wants us to live by this. Colossians 3.14 says to put on love, 
1 Corinthians 14, 1 says to pursue love. Philippians 1, 9 says that our love should abound more and more. 1 Peter 1, 22 says love one another earnestly with a pure heart. 1 John 4, 7 through 8 says let us love one another. Proverbs 10, 12 says love covers all sins. Ephesians 5, 1 says that we should walk in love. And here in Romans 13, it says love fulfills the law. Love, 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 love. I mean, do you think it's important that our Heavenly Father wants us to be people that love? Think it's important for Him? Do you think it's important for us as a congregation that we be a congregation that loves? Yes, we are to love every day to everyone. So, how are we doing? How are we doing in our homes? Are we loving? Are we fulfilling the law of love in our homes? Outside our homes? Are we fulfilling that law? I mean, we got to be honest here. Let's be real honest. It's not always easy to love others. It's not. It's not always easy to be kind and tenderhearted with one another. It's not easy to put away our bitterness and our anger and our clamor and our slander. It's not always easy to forgive. To love others would mean that we would have to be self-sacrificing. It would mean that we would have to be vulnerable with our hearts. It would mean that we would have to go places and do things that sometimes we may not want to do because it truly scares us. Some here may not even love themselves. So how can we love others? See, the truth is that we all have different idiosyncrasies inside ourselves that make us hard to move and to gravitate towards love. We each have defense mechanisms inside our hearts. We have triggers. We have fears. We have anxieties. We have doubts. And if you're like me, we're selfish. I'm selfish. We put up walls in our hearts to protect ourselves so that others don't get in and hurt us? So how? With all this inside our hearts, how can we love others? Again, I'm going to give you some advice that helped me. Before I was saved, I lived like this. I was afraid to love. I kept my circle small. I didn't want these people to affect me. These people wronged me, so I'm going to be bitter towards them. I'm going to be defensive. I didn't love. But here's what helped me. You want to love? Surrender to it. Surrender to love. Surrender to the Spirit. Give into it. Cast off all the works of the flesh and of darkness and put on the armor of light. See, we keep from loving others because we don't want to get hurt, because we're afraid. But God did not give us a spirit of fear. He gave us a spirit of power and of love and of self-control. God gives us a spirit to love. And when we hide behind our walls, we're only acting out in our flesh. We're not acting out of the spirit. It's all about the flesh. It's all about me. Well, I hide behind my walls so that I don't get hurt. I, my, I, me, me, me. Well, is it about you or is it about others? Which one is it? Because if it's about you, you're not fulfilling the law and you're not loving. But if it's about you willing to be vulnerable, willing to come out, willing to be bearing, self-sacrificing, oh, now you're fulfilling the law. So if you're hiding, if you're bitter, if you're angry, or if you're snarky, please know that that's not love and you're not loving when you're in your homes, kids, and you speak this way to your family or you, you speak and interact this way with your brother and sisters, that's not loving. And you're not fulfilling the law. Love is bearing with one another, caring, sacrificing, encouraging. It's not being bitter. It's not being angry. It's not being snarky. It's not, oh, I'm going to get you back. You did this to me, so now I'm going to do this. I'm going to get you back. That's not love. None of those traits are ever going to fulfill the law, ever. And we have to examine our hearts to make sure that we're not harboring these traits. 
And that goes for me as well. Please know that I'm preaching to myself as well. I've had my time to sit here and meditate on these verses. I had my time to sit there and write this down, this message down. And believe me, when you preach and you've got to write this stuff down, you inspect your life and you sit there and say, am I doing this? Am I loving like this? Because the last thing I ever, ever want to do is be a hypocrite. The minute that I find out that I'm a hypocrite is the last time I'll ever come up and preach. I have to make sure that I am acting and moving in this direction as well. So please know I'm not just preaching to you. I've already preached to myself. And we have to start fulfilling the law in our homes. It has to start there first. And then from there, we can adventure outside our homes. So families, love each other. Bear with one another. Speak kindly to one another. And forgive one another. If you forgive much, you love much. And if you don't forgive much, then you don't really love much. Now, the Lord equips us and the Lord grounds us in love. And so for those of us who have accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have all the power in the world to love others on a completely different level. Romans 5.5 5 says that God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So once we've accepted Christ, all the resources in the universe to love has been poured into our hearts. The capacity to love others is inside us. The capacity to fulfill the needs of others and to provide for others lives inside us. The capacity to love our enemies is in us. The problem is us. Sometimes we are the problems. We set the limit to how much we're going to love. We set up boundaries to who we'll love and how long we'll love them. But again, that's not leading and walking in the spirit. That's the flesh leading here. We have to continuously surrender to the Spirit and lay down our fleshly desires and put them aside. Again, we have to accept Jesus Christ. If you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I don't think that you can love in the self-sacrificing way that I'm speaking about here because you're always going to be thinking about yourself. You're always going to be allowing the flesh to lead. You have to accept Christ. You have to know him. And if you don't know him, and if you haven't accepted Christ, come talk to me. Those of you listening online, if you haven't accepted Christ, talk to me. Let me explain to you how he loves you. Let me show you in the Bible acts of love so that you can put away your anger, and you can put away your bitterness, and you can stop hiding. You can come out. Because you know that his love is going to care for you. He loved us so much that he died on the cross for us. Christ died while we were yet still sinners. And we who believe now have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit inside us. The Spirit of God dwells in us. And if we adhere to it and if we surrender to it, we'll grow and we'll blossom in the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit being what? Love, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control. But again, the very first fruit that we come across is love. You can't sit there and say, I'm a Christian, but I don't know how to love. It's impossible. It's in you. You can't sit there and say, well, I'm afraid to love. God didn't give you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love. It's in you. It's in us. We have the capacity to love. And we must allow the spirit to lead us in this direction. Surrender your fears. Surrender your hesitations, your past hurts, and allow the spirit to work in you. We are a new creation. The old has passed away. Amen? We don't have to remain behind our walls. We don't have to hide and guard ourselves so that we, we are protected. We don't need that. 
Guess what? God can protect you more than you can protect you. So we don't have to remain behind our walls. Get out from your walls like I did. We have to remember Christ at the cross. Oh, beautiful Christ. Our sins, our wrongs, nailed them there. He bled for us wretched sinners. He bled for us. He died for us. He forgives us. And then he reconciles us. Why? Because he loved us. He saw a need that we could not fulfill. Only he could fulfill it. And he did. He was obedient. And he was loving. And he sacrificed himself for us. What more of an example of love do you need? For God so loved the world, if you know it, say it with me, that he gave his only begotten son, right? That should, whoever believes in it should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. What are we giving? What are we holding on to? Give. We love because he loved us first. Now, Christ did not come to abolish the law. Christ came to fulfill the law. And now it's our turn to fulfill the law. Love those in your families. Love those that are standing next to you at the grocery store. Love those all around you, even your enemies. Love them. Don't just look at them as people, but rather look at them as souls. <laughs> I think my family gets annoyed with me because I just talk to everybody. There's dad again, talking to that person. Where's dad? Oh, he's talking to that person. But I don't just see people. I see opportunities to show love. I see them as souls that may need help. I, I, I see them as, as maybe I can do something to, to show them, to satisfy a need for them. And it's not difficult. It could be as easy as, as lending someone an inflatable queen-size mattress. It could be that easy. We are children saved by grace and by love. And may we continue to seek to fulfill the needs of others. And may our hearts be increased by the Spirit who's been poured into our hearts. I think on my gravestone, I'm going to have this etched in there. Love never fails. Love never fails. I have hurts. I have wounds. And they run deep. But I'm never going to give up. I'm never going to give up on those people because I love them. And so I'll have to be long-suffering and I'll, I'll have to be patient. But isn't that what Jesus Christ was? Isn't that what God is? Suffering and long, patient, but yet he loves. Isn't that the whole story about the prodigal son coming back and the father just sitting there waiting? Why? Because he loved. We may have to do that as well. Please know that love never fails. That we are in debt to love. It is our charge. It is what we owe. Because that is how Christ loved us. Love fulfills the law. Let us pray. <sighs> Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, I know for me in my own heart that there is room for me that I can be more loving and more encouraging that I can be more bearing with my family, with my friends, with my co-workers. Father, help us to deny ourselves daily, to pick up our cross, to follow you, to look for opportunities to fulfill the law of love and of Christ in our homes and with others. Lord, I pray that this message would be received well, that it would be an encouragement. And Lord, I am so grateful for the love that you had for us, for me. So grateful that your love pulled us out of darkness and placed us into the light. May we walk in love.
today, Father. And every day, give us the strength to walk in love and to be in the light. Lord, there's nothing I can do. There's no amount of number of ways I can say thank you for what you've done to, for us because you loved us. But we are grateful and we are humbled. So, Lord, thank you for your love. May we be blessed by it and may we walk in love for this day and every day coming after. Thank you, Lord Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.